This video covers the second half of chapter 15, getting into graduate school for PSY 120, careers in psychology, neuroscience, and human development. In this uh, part of the, the chapter, you're talking about more of the practical aspects of getting into uh, or selecting and getting into graduate schools, some of the steps that you need to take in order to make good decisions along the way. The first step um, after you've decided that you are going to graduate school is to make some selections of programs. Notice the plural there. What I always encourage students to do if they're intending to go to graduate school is to pick a handful. Um, it can get expensive if you decide you're going to cast a very wide net to try and get into programs um, and then choose from them. Uh, there are application fees. There are fees for um, doing, doing things like sending test scores and stuff like that. So you need to think about what your budget is um, and select your programs carefully. Once you've decided on a subfield of psychology, and particularly if you're thinking about the doctoral uh, programs, um, what kind of training model suits you best, um, then you need to gather, gather information about specific graduate programs. There are some um, databases out there that you can use um, for a, a subscription fee. And it, I don't believe it's terribly pricey. You can get access to the APA's Graduate Studies in Psychology web, website, which allows you to search for programs in specific content areas and programs of specific types. Um, and that can be a quick way of getting a solid first list of potential programs that are a good fit for your interests um, and the, the particular degree that you're wanting to pursue. Once you have um, a selected set of programs, um, oh, and I will say one of the reasons that using the APA site can be helpful is that let's say you just put in Google a search for master's programs in psychology um, some of the first sites that will come up <clears throat> are um, for-profit sites that are trying to sell you information that purports to increase your chances of getting into schools. Um, the lists appear to be comprehensive, but they rarely are, and they don't necessarily lead you to official websites for actual graduate programs nor do they provide you with some of the same kind of evaluative information that you can get from the APA site. So for example, the APA site's gonna give you um, information about uh, the number of students typically accepted, the percentage acceptance rate. They're going to give you a range of GRE scores that are typically seen as acceptable. Um, they'll give you concrete information on degrees that are offered in that program and so on. Um, the for-profit sites are going to be less likely to provide you um, that level of good information. It's not to say that you can't use Google um, to get information, especially if you're very, very region-bound, um, and some people are. You may want to look um, in concentric circles away from where you need to stay and look at the programs that are actually available to you and see whether there are any that meet your needs. So they, there are a number of criteria that you're gonna be um, using here to make some decisions. Just try and get access to the broadest, best information that you can before you make your choices. Once you've selected some potential programs, get on those department program um, and program websites to get um, more information um, if it's doctoral programs, especially get to know who the faculty are and what kind of research they're doing. Because again, in doctoral programs, it's really about fit. Um, if you're talking about the scientist researcher model and the, the scientist practitioner model, not so much the, the professional um, root of the PsyD. Um, at the master's level, what you're primarily looking for is uh, the specific uh, areas of training that will be offered for those 
um, pursuing that degree and making sure that it actually does what you need it to do to get you to your career goals. Look at the degrees, the coursework, the research um, that's being done, um, depending on you know the nature of the program, what kind of supervision opportunities are present, um, get to know who the faculty are and what kind of resources are available. Um, if it's graduate programs that include the doctoral degree, you'll want to ask questions about assistantships, teaching assistantships and research assistantships, because those will be important to your decision making about whether it is affordable for you to go into that program. Um, with master's programs, you can ask about those opportunities as well. They are somewhat more rare than in doctoral programs, but they occasionally do pop up. I've had a couple of students who were in master's programs who were offered um, TA type positions, um, but it was, it's been very, very rare for that to occur. So essentially, you really want to know whether the program that you're looking at is going to fit with what you need. Um, you don't want to go into a program just because it's down the road, just because it's convenient. You need to make sure that it has the coursework and the end goal training that's going to fit you. One thing that I talk to students about um, when we're considering graduate school is to think about the, the department um, and the program's emphasis um, and in some ways its philosophy. How, what, how that's going to be communicated to potential students is usually in a statement of goals and objectives. Um, and if you can read those goals and objectives, um, in some cases programs will put a mission statement. Um, I, I don't see those all the time, but they can show up. And you want to make sure it fits your goals and values. So for example, um, when I talk to students about these kinds of things, we often get into a conversation about the difference between clinical programs and counseling programs. Counseling programs tend to be more holistic and health focused. So seeing the person as basically healthy, but struggling with current demands and issues. Clinical programs tend to be a more medical model type of program, and they also tend to focus on training and preparation for helping people um, and providing treatment to people who have more serious mental health problems. Um, so you know, that's what we're talking about in terms of program emphasis or program philosophy. Social work problem programs, um, again, tend to be even more holistic than counseling programs and really uh, focus on the person embed, embedded in a wider environment and the need for not just counseling services, but also services in other aspects of that person's life to improve their living situation. So those are the kind of, of questions you have to ask um, and uh, put that in the context of it, does it fit your own goals? Um, you, you can get a sense when you look at the curriculum if it's really, really heavily research oriented, but that's not your thing and that's not what you want to have in your back pocket when you're done, then you may want to move to a more applied type of program that's much more directed at getting you um, uh, fairly quickly and efficiently to licensure. Um, there are some programs that are a very even hybrid of the two, um, but that's what, why you need to look at and ask these questions. Especially for doctoral programs, you really need to pay attention to who the faculty are and whether or not you have shared research interests. Um, why this matters so much is that there are a very small number of positions in these doctoral programs that are going to come open every year. You are going to fit better if you can, in your letters of interest, you can state I have research interests in common with X faculty member who studies blank, 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 and you show that you have looked at, you've read some of the work done by that faculty member, you have research interests in the same vein, and how you see that fitting into your graduate career. Um, you can use 
um, Psych Info. You can look at their publications and get a sense of what their what their primary work is. Um, and also you can you can kind of tell whether they've been publishing with students because that can be an important factor, um, especially if you're a person who is wanting to pursue an academic career um, in uh, higher education. You can ask questions um, as you get into the process of, um, and sometimes you can find this information on web pages. Other times you really need to suss it out by calling or emailing. You can ask questions about where graduates end up, um, what's the rate of graduation, um, what's the breakdown kind of of whether they find jobs in academia, in private practice, and uh, et cetera. You can also ask, and this is usually, the, you, you can find minimal information about this on program websites, but you may need to ask the question either through phone call or email about assistantships uh, that might be available at the university where the graduate program is housed. If you're working toward an applied field, say clinical counseling, social work, school psychology, um, so these practice oriented fields, it is critical that you apply to an APA accredited um, program. Um, the reason why is because it's very difficult, if not impossible, to get a um, an internship position after you finish your graduate degree if your your degree did not come from an APA accredited program. Um, so that that's like a an absolute requirement if you're going to invest in graduate school to become a professional in a practice oriented field you need to um, pursue that at an APA accredited program most graduate schools are still requiring the the graduate record exam the the broad test um, Although there are a few universities that are sort of dispensing with it, most of them are still hanging on to it. Um, the GRE, it's basically the SAT on steroids, although not a giant dose of it. It's a standardized test um, that uh, measures a wide range of skills and has uh, three basic scores, uh, verbal ability um, in written language, basically, quantitative ability and analytical ability. Um, on average, it takes about four hours to complete, um, which includes some break times and instruction time. Um, the general test is something you can go to a testing center and take the test um, by computer at that testing center. Uh, those are typically offered year round. Um, the, the scoring, you know, like the ACT and the SAT, um, some people do extraordinarily well on these tests, some people not so much. My G GRE scores were not impressive. <laughs> they, were, they were offset by my, my GPA, but they were a part of the bigger picture of my performance. Um, average GRE scores are included, as I mentioned before, in the APA Guide to Graduate Study in Psychology um, database. And that can give you a sense. There are some really high profile graduate programs. They will have very high GRE limits um, where you have to be above that break point or they are not going to consider you. So like Stanford or whatever, Yale, Harvard, they're going to have really high thresholds. Other schools are going to have much lower thresholds for GRE scores. And then a handful aren't going to require it at all. The psychology test is rarely um, required today. Um, basically, this is a, uh, a subject matter test uh, asking questions specifically about psychology. There was a time when all doctoral programs required this if people were going to study in psychology and psychology related areas. Um, these days, uh, a lot of programs are just sort of dispensing with it. It's harder to get asked, access to. Um, it, it's typically administered in person by paper and pencil at, at very restricted times of the year. 
um, usually three times of the year. Um, what you can do, again, the APA guidebook, uh, the online site for grad programs, will tell you whether or not that GRE uh, psychology or subject matter test is required. The websites should tell you as well. Um, master's programs very rarely ask for the psychology test. Virtually every graduate program is going to ask for a personal statement um, that is usually it's going to be very general. Other times it will have a very specific prompt that they want you to respond to. Um, personal statements or admissions essays, uh, as you learned in um, assignment five, it's a chance for you to communicate with admissions committees about what you want to do, who you are, who you'd like to work with, if it's a doctoral program, what kind of research you'd like to do, if it's a research-oriented program, what your specific practice area interest is, if it's a practice-oriented program. It's a chance for you to, to um, set yourself apart, make yourself um, distinctive, um, but also to be clear about who you are, your interests, your aspirations, your values. It will tell the admissions committee also about your writing competency that goes beyond the GRE test, um, your ability to be professional and to be persuasive. It allows you to show some enthusiasm um, in a way that is uh, candid, but also professional in nature. Um, if it's a PhD program or a doctoral program, it, it's a chance for individual faculty to read that statement and say, yes, this is a student that I could work with um, and would be valued asset in my lab. As you learned in assignment five, um, applications are um, typically accompanied by a curriculum vita. Um, not all of them require it, but it's a good idea to provide one. This is a, the academic version of a resume, as you learned in Assignment 5. And it just presents the information that would typically be in a resume with additional academic highlights, um, particularly highlighting um, work that you've done at the collegiate level, at the bachelor's level, that shows your acumen for graduate study. So if you've worked in a research lab, if you've done independent research, if you've done internships, those sorts of things are particularly important. Um, unlike a resume, which they're usually quite short, CVs tend to be longer and have more information about your academic work. So the goal is to, to really present yourself as a scholar because that is what is being sought um, particularly for doctoral programs. The typical components, and, and these this list is less relevant to a bachelor's level person, but these are the general components of a, a professional CV in academia. Um, the basic content informa contact information, educational background, uh, it, awards and achievements, if you've had any um, while in college, research experience, and that can include, you know, in our programs, we require you to do a research project from start to finish. Um, and that includes getting IRB approval um, and conducting research, writing the research up, and then presenting it publicly. Um, though that research experience as an individual is important. If you've done um, a direct or not a directed an independent study with a faculty member doing research in their lab or pursuing your own research that can be um, beneficial to your application. <clears throat> Conference presentations, you can include, say, presentations at Scholar Day in that place. Um, also, if you've got, attended any undergraduate research conferences, it can go there. Um, rarely will bachelor's level students have teaching experience. Um, it can happen, but it's rare. Um, same goes for um, professional experiences and relevant coursework that you may have taught. Um, the, the next bullet point, relevant coursework and technical skills, though, are things that you will have picked up along the way. 
um, to completing your bachelor's degree, such as having the full complement of research methods and senior research coursework, coursework rel relevant to your um, area of interest, um, those sorts of things. If you've applied for and received any um, grants for doing projects, and those happen, they're, they're not common, but there are undergraduate research awards that you can seek and, and get that would be put on your CV. Um, any organizations that you belong to, uh, such as Psychi, which is also an honorary, um, can be relevant here. And then uh, references. Make sure that the people you include as references at the end of your CV are people who you have asked and have gotten permission from to include as your references. Letters of recommendation are very important when you're applying to graduate school. The selection committee is going to look at those letters of recommendation as a, a key piece of information helping them to decide whether or not you're a good fit for their program. So virtually every graduate program is going to require at least three letters of recommendation. Um, the typical expectation is that these be um, letters coming from uh, faculty members, but they could also be coming from supervisors at a practicum placement. Um, they're typically faculty members who have had um, enough experience with the student to comment in detail about the student's personal qualities, they, what they've accomplished, um, what makes them unique or special, um, or particularly well suited to the, the graduate's program that they're applying to. Letter writers are, are going to be often asked to kind of fill out a, uh, a short set of questions that are closed ended, but then they will be asked to write a free form letter providing specific information about the applicant. Th that means that you need to choose your letter writers carefully. You don't just randomly select um, your advisor if your advisor doesn't know you well. If they haven't had you in class, if they don't know much about you, they're not going to be able to provide enough information in their letter to support your application. So you wanna choose faculty members who know you well who can comment on your skills and abilities and can weigh in um, with information that will make you stand out. So they need to understand your career goals. Um, and it is critical that the person, the people you select um, are going to write about you positively. Um, that doesn't mean that they're going to um, sugarcoat what they write. You know, faculty members, when they write letters, have an ethical uh, obligation to be honest. If you, for example, if you were a student who did poorly in a class, um, missed a lot of assignments, were absent without explanation, um, if you uh, had difficulties with other students in class, and then you expect that faculty member to write you a positive letter, um, you're not going to get it. So. If you've had difficulties in the past um, in school, and lots of people do, you need to have a careful conversation with the faculty member you're asking now to put their name on an evaluation and a recommendation to a graduate program. I've had students who did had really rough time their first couple of years in college, who then worked very, very hard to come back from that, to build um, a set of skills and abilities and who showed me over time that they could be successful in graduate school. So what I talked about in the letter is their growth and development over time, kind of putting in context their, their academic record um, so that the, the reader of that letter can have a good understanding of who this person is over time. Faculty who write letters or, you know, if it's an internship supervisor, they need to be able to put you in a favorable position in comparison to your peers. Um, so it, in large part, what faculty are going to be asked to do is to compare you with other students in your program. Um, 
who might be in the same position that you are in terms of applying for um, a slot in a graduate program. Your, your letter writers are typically going to look at uh, academic performance, your skills in those areas, any experience they have with you in terms of research, um, as well as your experience in other kinds of, of activities, um, uh, co-ops, internships, work experience, and so on. The more they know about you, the, the better they're going to be able to write a good letter. The kinds of things that uh, programs are looking for in their recommendation forms and in letters of recommendation is information about these kinds of qualities. And they're what you probably expect. You know, how motivated is this person? What's their scholarly ability? Are they emotionally stable? Are they mature enough to do group work and to be trusted to work independently? Can they write? Can they speak? Um, do they have the potential for teaching skills, for leadership? Um, how well do they work with others? Um, and their, their knowledge of the, the area that they're interested in studying. When you approach faculty for letters, and the faculty in, your, in, this, in our program, we talk about this a lot. Something that we really do not like is when students, without telling us, apply to a graduate program, and then we get an automated letter stating that um, we're now to write a recommendation letter for such and such a student to this program, but we've never been asked to do so. Um, that's, a, that's a real no-no. <laughs> um, faculty are not required to write you letters of recommendation, and we're definitely not required to write you good recommendations because that may be dishonest. Um, so you need to approach potential recommenders. You have to approach them in person, uh, if possible, um, at the very least by a properly written email, and ask them if they feel comfortable writing you a letter to accompany your application to graduate school. Um, pay attention to how they respond to this request. Um, you know, before you ask, take a look at your performance in their classes, really give yourself an honest examination of how you think you get along with this person and whether or not they have the ability to write a detailed letter. If they seem reluctant, don't pursue it. Um, ask someone else. If they outright deny your request, don't push it, just walk away and find someone else. What it means when a faculty member is resistant isn't that they are lazy or uncooperative. What it typically means is they don't believe that they can give you a positive recommendation. Remember that a wishy-washy, non-detailed letter isn't helpful. Um, it may not be that they're gonna give you a negative recommendation. It may be that they just don't know you well enough to give detailed information. Um, those are letters that are super hard to write, and you just end up writing very general things based on what you can see on the, the, the record. That doesn't help a selection committee because it doesn't have enough detail. So what you're looking for is faculty who know you well and know you across a variety of contexts and can give a fair and balanced recommendation for you as you, you seek admittance. You should be prepared to give your letter writer additional information. Um, faculty, you know, we have access to your unofficial transcript, so you don't need to worry about that. I typically ask for um, student CV. Um, if they have GRE scores, I ask to know what they are, at least in a general sense. Um, if you have a list of courses you've taken with a particular faculty member, that's helpful. Um, if you have an example, a sample of writing that you feel is excellent, it's helpful to see that. Uh, I typically don't ask for that. I typically ask for um, your, your resume or your CV um, and uh, additional information that would be put in your uh, personal statement. So sometimes what I do is I ask the student for their resume, CV, and their personal statement 
that they're going to use to accompany their application because between those two things, you'll have most of the other stuff included. I also ask applicants to give me the specific programs they're applying to, what the degree is that they're applying for, and when the application is due. If there are any specific um, forms or materials that I need to see, they need to provide that. Now, most programs are going to use a system, an online system for submission of letters today. Um, so what you will be providing the graduate program is the name and email address for your recommender. But do this other stuff first. Ask them, get a sense that they know you well enough to give a recommendation that is detailed, and then um, get their permission to provide the graduate program with your email address. Some programs require interviews either in person or online um, or by phone. Um, On-site interviews, if you are going into a clinical or counseling program, um, the, the applied areas, the service related areas, um, interviews are likely. They want to know who you are, what your demeanor is, how you interact with other people. Um, the interview is going to give the admissions committee a chance to um, see people under pressure, to talk to them, make eye contact with them, and see who they are as people, as opposed to who they are on paper. Um, so most of the, the practice-oriented fields are going to have um, either uh, in-person or at the very least um, interviews that take place uh, on video. Um, in some cases, there will be an introductory interview that's by phone or by video. Um, and then there may be a follow-up interview where some final candidates are brought to campus. Those are typically PhD programs in those applied practice-oriented areas. Um, doctoral programs in non-practice-oriented areas um, are far less likely to have an interview process. They're much more likely to just take people uh, on paper and make decisions. Um, there will occasionally be phone calls or um, uh, video interviews where a particular faculty member wants to get a better sense of what your research plans and interests are um, for those doctoral programs. Master's programs that are practice oriented will typically have an interview. Make sure that as you prepare for interviews that you study up, get familiar with the program description, um, the information provided on the department website, um, and the faculty members' websites, if they are available, um, have a good understanding the programmed uh, emphasis and values, um, and a broad sense of the research agendas in research-oriented programs, if that's where you're going. Um, for practice-oriented fields, study up and have a good, solid understanding of the philosophy of the program and the, the typical um, content of the, the program, the, the type of, pro, of content that the program is going to offer. Um, you, can, you can sometimes get a sense of what your authors call the emotional climate of the program um, by looking at web-based materials, but you may not be able to get that um, unless you are able to talk with students who are in the program. Sometimes you can get a sense of it, but just um, looking at the way the program presents itself. They may present themselves as being very uh, familial, very connected, very empathetic. Um, other programs, they'll look like what they are and what they are is very competitive. Um, so, you know, you have to think about what that climate looks like and feels like for you. <clears throat> if you have to do online interviews, and this is becoming more common. I mean, we all learned how to do it during the pandemic, so I don't see it going away anytime soon. It's a far more economical process for all parties um, involved. Um, in, initial interviews are, are often conducted online. 
graduate programs may interview people in this really cheap, um, efficient way because it allows them to um, meet face to face, although not physically, a broader sampling of potential students. <clears throat> in the past, they would have to, you know, give up a great deal of time from schedules to bring in um, a small number of students to campus. And if none of those students pan out or only a small number do, then they have to bring more. It can be a very um, exhausting process. Online interviews are faster. You can squeeze a lot more into a small amount of time. Um, in interviews, regardless of whether it's in person or not, you're going to meet with representatives of an admissions committee made up of faculty, sometimes of students as well. Um, and you will be asked questions designed to see whether you fit well with the program. Um, you should treat uh, online interviews just like you would in-person interviews. Find a location to set up your video um, that is um, not distracting. So, for example, if you have all kinds of posters and, and weird stuff up on your wall, Take your computer and go to the library, <laughs> go somewhere with blank walls where you can um, have a less distracting environment um, to conduct your interview. Make sure that the space where you are doing the interview will be free of noise and interruptions and wear appropriate professional clothing um, so that you can make a good impression. <clears throat> Basic recommendations, study up, be prepared, uh, think about how you're presenting yourself, how you're sitting, how you're making eye contact. You know, what we've all learned over the last few years about video is how hard it is to look at the camera and not the faces of the people on the screen. Um, uh, I don't know how newscasters do that. I've never been able to successfully get through a meeting um, while staring at the camera and not having my eyes drift down lower to look at the screen where the people are. Um, so do some practicing, have some, some conversations with your friends where you practice looking straight into the camera because as your um, interviewers are looking at you, they're gonna look to see whether you can um, look at them. Um, and the weird thing about video um, interviews is that that juxtaposition, you know, you may be looking at their eyes, but when you do, you're not looking at your camera. So that kind of practice can be really helpful, um, focusing on that. I believe that the Career Services Office, <clears throat> Career Development Office on campus, um, has the facility to allow you to do practice interviews with them. And that kind of practice, you know this from your oral communication, experiences in your um, IC classes, uh, practicing giving presentations, practicing being face-to-face -face with people and communicating with them pays off um, in, in the process. So the same goes for interviews. And that concludes my coverage of chapter 15.